Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Julian Assange of WikiLeaks fame obtained and published classified documents as a part of his journalism, and yet he still resides at the Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison in southeast London, confined to a 6 by 12 foot cell 23 hours a day with a single hour of recreation taking place within four walls under supervision. That does not seem fair. A few weeks ago, we interviewed a guest who literally wrote the book on this whistleblower, and now he returns to discuss an impending court decision that could free Julian or extradite him to the U.S. for execution, or something in the middle. Let's discuss. Well, we are back in a a follow-up with with Kevin Gastola, who was on our podcast just a a week or two ago and uh, talking about the... uh, Julian Assange issue, and we reviewed his book, Guilty of Journalism. That was a good interview. We got a lot of good feedback from you, Kevin. And uh, things have happened since then. A couple of days ago, the uh, court made a decision and regarding the, the situation with Julian and his incarceration. And frankly, Greg and I are kind of in the, in the fog about what to make about it. Some of the articles are very positive, some are not, um, and that's why we want you to fill us in. You have been on this beat since the very beginning, and you're one of the best journalists and experts on the subject, so fill us in. What's going on with the recent court case in London? Yeah, things are happening, and a lot of times things aren't happening in this case, and that there's been a lot of limbo for Julian Assange, and that has contributed to his deteriorating mental and physical health. Uh, We're going on five years, as you talked to me, on April 11th. That's five years since he was expelled from the London Embassy uh, for Ecuador, Ecuador's London Embassy, and then arrested and brought to Belmarsh, which has a reputation as being a kind of British Guantanamo due to the people who are held there. What I'll say is, I tend to agree with the people who say any day that Julian Assange isn't being extradited to the United States is a victory for this struggle to free Julian Assange and to fight this attack on freedom of the press. Now let's get into the real reality of what was decided by the High Court of Justice in London. Uh, What they said was that Julian Assange's request for an appeal uh, could be granted. There were nine different issues raised by Julian Assange's lawyers, and they only accepted that two and a half of them were valid. Now, I know you've been around for a while. You may wonder why the math comes out to being two and a half. It's because if you read closely, one of the issues, they don't exactly say that Julian Assange has a fair claim that his right to freedom of the press or freedom of expression, as they would say, is being violated. But they do connect it back to another issue, a can of worms, so to speak, that was very boneheadedly opened by the lead prosecutor for the United States, who has represented, who's made all these representations to the UK judges over the last five years about how Julian Assange will be treated. One of the things he said, and he actually wrote this down, and I don't know why he didn't second guess writing this down, but but the truth came out that if Julian Assange was put on trial, the US government would likely argue in court that Julian Assange had no First Amendment rights because he was a foreign national. And that, that bothered the judges in this case enough that they said, we'll listen to uh, your appeal. We will let you challenge that way that Julian Assange would be treated, that there would be prejudice because of his nationality. That can be a reason not to extradite somebody to the United States. And then they also took seriously the part of the proceedings in February where an attorney representing the uh, home secretary 
which is the authority that authorizes extradition, uh, they had told the judges that they didn't believe there was any thing they could say to guarantee that Julian Assange wouldn't face the death penalty if he was put on trial. And the way they got to the death penalty was not to say that, oh, the Espionage Act carries that as a sentence. It doesn't. When you are charged with an Espionage Act violation, the maximum you can receive is a 10-year sentence. And even if you have multiple Espionage Act charges against you, you usually get to serve your sentence concurrently. So in most of these cases against whistleblowers and then now Julian Assange, you'll, you'll see people with multiple offenses. They'll go to jail for like five, six years tops. Um, but so the way they get to the death penalty is that the U.S. won't assure or won't say that they have no intention of adding charges against Julian Assange when he arrives in the United States. And we've seen a lot of allegations made about Julian Assange's conduct in the last year, uh, I mean, the last 10 years, by the national security state itself, by Senate investigations, who've alleged that he was working for Russia during 2016 when he published the Clinton campaign emails, although they provided no evidence. That's what a lot of politicians believe. So what if they added a charge of aiding and abetting treason? which can carry the death penalty? Or what if they added an espionage charge in the classic sense, like as you, under, you and me understand it, where someone's accused of being a spy for a foreign power. We're not talking about releasing information to the press. We're actually talking about an allegation that someone was working for a foreign government. They could do that. And if they did that, those crimes carry possibilities of being put to death. That's historically how those charges have been brought against individuals. So this is the most significant aspect of the decision. And then where people get confused, if I can conclude my answer and we can progress in our conversation about the decision, what was confusing is that the High Court of Justice included a paragraph in their decision where they told the United States government okay, we know we object to this extradition on these two grounds and we're ready for an appeal, but here's what you can do to avoid an appeal here. Just tell us you won't impose the death penalty. Just tell us you think that Julian Assange's rights will be protected as a defendant under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You say if he wants to make a First Amendment challenge to the United States Espionage Act, that's something that could be available to him. And then we won't grant Julian Assange an appeal hearing. We're kind of in this in-between. That's why it's confusing. There is no hearing scheduled for an appeal. There is a hearing that'll likely happen in May, on May 20th, when these judges will hear all these empty promises, all these pledges from U.S. officials about how they aren't going to violate Julian Assange's rights. And it's been quite a long saga Oftentimes people can't keep it all straight, but we were already here before when it came to how he would be treated in prison or detention. There were very serious concerns that were raised on the part of the judge. So his extradition was blocked back on January 4th, 2021, and it forced the United States government into an appeal and they had to put forward assurances about how Julian Assange would be treated in their custody. And those assurances were not worth the paper that they were written on. There were so many loopholes that I have picked out. Others have picked out. People talked about why you shouldn't accept those as valid uh, promises. But uh, here we are again, and they have a possibility of avoiding an appeal. Well, let, let's let's talk about the prison itself. This prison, Belmarsh Prison, I went on the internet and got a couple of pictures of Julian Assange's uh, cell. And um, it's six foot by 12 foot. That was a, a sample cell. This is an actual, that's his, this is a picture of his actual cell. And you can see it's, it, it's horrific. It's a bed, a small desk, uh, a toilet, um small amount of light coming in 
20 hours a day in that prison, uh, then one hour outside where he can exercise only under the supervision of other guards. Why wouldn't they just want to delay this as long as possible? Because he's uh, his uh, no human being could tolerate that degree of solitary confinement for that period of time. And, and he's 6'2", by the way. He's a big man. Um, why wouldn't they just want to drag this out and hope that his mental health deteriorates to the point where he's a shell of who he is? I don't know. What's your thought about that? I think that's a fair possibility. I think that's been a part of this case all along. The benefit the United States has, because this process takes quite a long time to unfold, they have been able to take advantage of seeing Julian Assange decline. It it makes him less of a threat to the United States right. because if his mental and physical abilities are not such uh, that he can walk out tomorrow and resume his work as the WikiLeaks editor in chief, return to the role he was playing back in 2010, which is you know what he's being targeted for in this case, then they've won. And and mm -hmm. uh, you know not only do you see that WikiLeaks's own credibility has been tarnished globally through their, their actions and uh, certain sl slanderous claims that have been made about the organization uh, when their ethics or their their journalistic work is attacked, but also. Um, you, you, and and in doing that, by the way, what that means is we live in this time right now when we could really use leaks, that they could really benefit us all if they were able to publish documents about the uh, war in Ukraine or uh, Israel's assault on Gaza would be areas where we would have a particular interest in reading what these European or NATO governments are doing or what the United States is doing. But, you know, they've destroyed WikiLeaks's credibility. So most whistleblowers are probably not going to risk going to WikiLeaks. But right. then you have the mental health and the physical health deteriorating for Assange, and, and that decreases the possibility that he resumes his duties. And then that's a win for the CIA all the way on down, all right. the intelligence agencies, all the military officials can breathe a sigh of relief and uh, say, yeah, we knocked out the pioneering leaks site and when this came on the scene in the late 2000s we were horrified that there were going to be imitation sites and there were going to be all kinds of different people who would be doing this and uh, even though you know, news media organizations do have submission systems for leaks like wikileaks it's different because those journalists are usually brought into the fold and we we do this thing called access journalism with them where we you know, we promise to keep them in the loop and work with them and talk and 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 get them to understand what we're doing because we you know we understand that we can it's a two-way street we we know that we have to let them cover us but we can also use them to funnel our own official stories and propaganda to them when it is useful to us but we can't do that with wikileaks and some of these other other organizations that would take after wikileaks you know, they these are stateless media organizations that don't want to work with the United States government and, and help advance our agenda. So they're I, I think they're happy to keep Julian Assange in this limbo, which is why I'm skeptical about, you know, we've had in the last couple of weeks since I spoke with you some rumors in the news about a plea negotiation between Julian Assange and the U.S. Justice Department. Or Julian Assange's legal team and some Justice Department prosecutors. I'm highly skeptical that there's any kind of pressure on those officials to resolve this as much as I would like to see some kind of an end for Julian Assange. Right. Greg, what are your general thoughts about I, this? I, I agree with Kevin. I think that the real value of Assange is harkens back to my own study and my own learning about the Rosenberg case in that particular moment, it really wasn't about stealing atomic secrets. It really wasn't about spying. It was about ginning up a Cold War and ginning up 
a popular response uh, against communism and against the Soviet Union and so on and so forth. And, and, and it was like throwing coal into the Cold War fire. And I think today Assange plays the same role. I don't think, I think Kevin's right. They would love to keep him right where he is because he constantly reminds people when they whip on him and suggest to people that we're in threat, we're in danger because people are looking long and hard into the way our government functions. Right. And they don't want that. So he serves a very useful purpose by keeping him in this limbo. You know, I, I, I think about these appeals and this whole legal process, and it, it's like death penalty sentence. I mean, the real torture, the real, uh, the real, the real ugliness of our death penalty revival in this country is the long process that a that a that a, pay, that a prisoner goes through, through appeals and uh, approaching the point where he's killed and then pull 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 her away from that and go back to that. I mean, just torture. And Assange is being tortured. I don't, I don't, I don't think that there's any other way of looking at what's happening to him other than he's being tortured. And I think you, Pat, or or or, or Kevin said, Belmarsh is like Guantanamo. It is. I mean, that's what it, that's the purpose it's serving. So, I don't know. I I wish we could be more optimistic, but uh, on the pessimistic side, or maybe on the optimistic side, is that they are going to keep him in the vice for a long time because it's useful for them to gin up all this uh, anti-subversive, anti, you know, pro-secrecy uh, stuff that they're engaged in. Right. Kevin, the last time we chatted, we mentioned the secure, the, the secure site that, that yeah. um, uh, uh, that's used for journalism. And, and this is in reference to the first amendment. It says, have a, uh, do you have a document to share? You're not anonymous, uh, and then it says you're not anonymous while using this browser. It tells them, it gives them directions on how to download a secure browser, Tor, Tor Project browser, and to then it has information on exactly how to send the documents. So it's giving instructions to the person who wants to share the documents. And I mentioned this last time, the people that participate with this group are uh, the New Yorker, Forbes, ProPublica, The Intercept, Washington Post, Guardian, Canadian Broadcast News, Associated Press, New York Times, US Today, Bloomberg News, Wall Street. That's just a partial list of the newspapers that uh, would be wanting somebody to give to submit anonymous information to uh, these news organizations. So there's your free, there's your First Amendment free speech. And the, what, what Julian Assange did with WikiLeaks is no different than what all of these other organizations are doing, unless you can somehow demonize him and say that he is not a real journalist or it's not a real website or that... Um, and that's a, that's exactly what our government has done to him. Is that is that correct? Tried to distinguish oh, yeah. him from legitimate whistleblower um, accumulating information with all these other press uh, press outlets. The New York Times problem, I think, is what they call it, right? The New York right. Times problem. Absolutely. So, in order for them to concoct this case and pursue Julian Assange in court, they have to go after him as if he is a hacker. Uh, and they actually, for what it's worth, I do want to say he does have hacking in his past. He came from that background when he was a young man in Australia. Uh, he did go through a legal case and was prosecuted. But there isn't anything in this indictment that comes close to being like hacking. What we see in the indictment is journalistic or news gathering activities. So they have to lie to you. They have to make it seem like what he was doing is different from what journalists do every single day. And some of some of you know some of what they do is 
use the newness of the internet to make you feel like what he was doing is different than old school journalism. But I don't think we should fall for that. I'm not suggesting that either of you do, but we should recognize that uh, the journalism that is engaged in online is no different from what people were doing when they walked around in, I don't know, to use stereotypes, trench coats with a pencil in their hat and walked around with a notepad and went to knock on doors or maybe met sources in a parking garage or however you imagine it from the way it's been depicted in entertainment in, in history, there, it's not very different what Julian Assange is doing. A, a, a source reached out to WikiLeaks at some point. We don't know if Julian Assange for sure uh, spoke with uh, Chelsea Manning. We don't know uh, if that was the person who was chatting with her, although that's what the U.S. government claims. But I will note that since I spoke with you, a journalist from Italy named Stefania Marizzi published an email from, uh, I believe it was, a, it was from the State Department, and it reflected the fact that the U.S. Army's uh, Criminal Investigation Division had no idea for certain if Julian Assange was this account that was uh, chatting with Chelsea Manning while she was on trial. So they, they they couldn't say for sure. And I don't know what evidence they would have obtained since to prove that he was chatting. And I only I only bring that into our conversation because as anyone who wonders how they're going to succeed in prosecuting Julian Assange should know that you have to be able to prove that person was in a conspiracy by placing them actually in the chair and using the account and engaged in the actions they're using this chat to say that he conspired with someone and if he wasn't the one chatting with the source then there is no conspiracy and he never um did the thing that he's being accused of doing but let's set that aside let's just uh say that chatting with a source is just the same as communicating with them on the telephone uh, doing this. And if this person that you're talking to, you want to advise them on how to not be caught by the authorities, source protection, that's very common. That's something you should do because you want to make sure that sources continue to turn to you. If you're a journalist and your sources are being prosecuted by the government every time that you talk to a source, how are you going to continue to do your work? And you're not going to keep getting material from those you're basically be done as a journalist because you can't keep your sources safe uh and so doing that kind of thing talking to her about this allegedly uh, all of these are news gathering activities offering a secure dropbox on the internet where you can submit your materials that you've obtained i mean that's no different than saying hey i'm going to give you this uh post office box I want you to go put your envelope of documents in back in the 70s or the or the or you know and then then we'll go to the box we'll pull out the envelope we'll have the materials and we'll be able to get the story out that you want us to tell people about FBI's COINTELPRO Pro or the Vietnam War or whatever we're going to expose. You know I, the last time you were on you I I complimented you uh, for uh, doing an interview with um, you know the Pink Floyd guy and the the CNN guy, and that how you would stop the tape and then tell them tell you know tell what the truth was about what they were were saying because there's um oftentimes it's the mainstream legacy press that's part of the problem. Four days ago, Mary Lou Kelly Lewis Kelly from NPR interviewed a. Jamel Jaffer of the Knights of the First Amendment Institute in Columbia University. And he came out and had a pretty strong case against the uh, government, our government, saying whether or not that, uh, like you said, whether or not, is he a journalist and is WikiLeaks considered a media organization? So Kelly, who's interviewing him, is basically just a stenographer for the Justice Department. She says, for example, he just indiscriminately published names of sources, that he encouraged people to steal documents, that he that the documents contained unredacted names, putting all of these sources at grave risk for you know being killed, and you know, and that he didn't do fact checking. In other words, 
that he just was just this kind of crazy loon that was just spilling out all of this information. And that's not correct, is it? I mean, he went through pretty, he went through a lot of uh, steps to control that. And just teaching somebody how to use a secure a Dropbox is not necessarily encouraging them to steal documents. I don't know. What's your thought about that? Yeah, no. So just the specifics there, and then maybe I'll pull out and quickly address the general issue of Mary Louise Kelly at NPR um, being so aggressive about her questions with Jamil Jaffer at the Knight First Amendment Institute, who, by the way, testified as a witness in Assange's defense for his uh, extradition hearing in September 2020. So when you look at what she's saying about the publication of sources, names, and the fact that human intelligence sources were exposed to harm and how, well, that's not what news media organizations do. We don't publish those names when we have documents. That's an ethical disagreement with Julian Assange. So let's just for a, for a moment, for the, for the sake of having an argument, let's just say Julian Assange did intentionally do the thing that the U.S. government has accused him of doing, and now they're prosecuting him. I think it's important for people who are listening to your podcast or watching to understand that that's not really a crime in the United States. At least it's not typically prosecuted or they've never gone after a publisher in this manner. And they do have something called the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, but that's for people who are contractors or employees of U.S. government agencies. It's a real big, giant gray area as to whether somebody who's a journalist or a publisher, especially somebody who's not from the United States, could be prosecuted. And he's also not even charged with this law. He's charged with violating the Espionage Act. And, uh, you know, this uh, kind of a ugly human being recently left us, Joe Lieberman, and he uh, entered uh, hopefully some dimension where he'll have to face what he did. Burn in hell. Burn yeah, in I hell, like, I say. yeah. 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 Let him burn it. in hell. Uh, uh, he <laughs> was one of the most aggressive political elites to go after Julian Assange and WikiLeaks when they revealed this information in 2010, uh, going to places like Amazon or PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, these other businesses, encouraging them to not allow donations to WikiLeaks anymore. And he even introduced legislation that would have made it a crime to publish classified information with the names of individuals who are working for the U.S. military, et cetera. But the law, but but that legislation never passed. So it's not a crime. It doesn't exist. What Mary Louise Kelly is objecting to is an ethical disagreement that someone should not be put on trial for doing. Again, I should say, if I publish the names of human intelligence sources tomorrow, Mary Louise Kelly could disagree with me but she would be completely out of line to argue to the Justice Department that I should be prosecuted for it. It would just mean that it becomes harder to do this work as a journalist. It would affect openness and freedom of the press. Uh, and, and so then just I would pull back and, and, and say that Julian Assange in general had an editorial process. WikiLeaks had an editorial process. We know they worked with journalists like Nikki Hagar and... Stefania Marizzi from Italy and Andy Worthington on the Guantanamo files and the Iraq uh, body count project on the Iraq war logs and that they were taking care with this material that they were partnering with media organizations that they were sifting through it they maybe didn't do as much as they should have done with the Afghanistan material but they did do a good job with the Iraq material and the U.S. state embassy cables, those diplomatic cables. And it was, in fact, uh, the, the worst example where they got in trouble for unredacted material ending up on the Internet can be attributed to The Guardian editor David Lee and his stupid, stupid decision to make the chapter headline of his book with Luke Harding the encrypted, uh, the password to an encrypted I file. <laughs> Yes. That, that that was shared. 
Um, right. And so right. now it was available. And then there were sleuths on the internet because they exist. And they went around and they found the file that WikiLeaks had been using to uh, help journalists access this material. And it's not that WikiLeaks did something wrong. This is a common process that even if you're not technologically literate enough to understand what they're doing, uh, that's okay. This is common. And it wasn't that they made a mistake. It was that the person who had the password on a post-it note that Julian Assange had handed to him was wrong to make this a part of their sensational. Um, by the way, it's not even a good book. It's very sleazy kind of tabloid uh, takedown of Julian Assange that I don't think has stood the test of time. It's a, quite an embarrassment now, given what Julian Assange is going through in the UK and with the US government prosecuting him. But um, just to let you both back in, I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying that Mary Louise Kelly and these other journalists who are so hostile with people who are supporters of Assange or just feel that they need to be aggressive with those who express civil liberties or press freedom advocacy that says that Julian Assange should have the charges dropped against him, are outing themselves as people who are basically never going to do the kind of work that Julian Assange did. They're not going to publish materials on wars. They're not going to release uh, these documents and share them with people so that their knowledge is improved. So all these organizations that you named that are using Secure Drop, it's to their credit that they've made this a part of their work. But there is a, a really good argument to say that they maybe should share more of the documents that they obtain, like WikiLeaks, because one of the reasons why WikiLeaks was such a big important development for our world is because we now had this access to knowledge. Could, could I ask a question just to clarify? Um, Thomas Agee wrote a book about the CIA years ago, and, and I think in the book or a subsequent book or a press, he re released the name of, a, of the head of the uh, Athens, I think, uh, CIA office. And subsequently, that guy was murdered, killed, whatever. Um, and I thought there was legislation passed. Did I misunderstand you uh, that that you cannot that you cannot leak these names? Uh, so uh, maybe Philip, I didn't, Philip, didn't listen. Philip I, Ag. I, I thought, go Philip ahead. Ag did do the thing you're describing, and it was in his book CIA Diary. I actually um, found it at a Goodwill store and grabbed it, and I was like, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go read this, uh, and. Uh, he then, then in response to that, to shut that down, uh, not only do we have a pre-publication review process that really violates the First Amendment rights systematically of U.S. government employees, but it also, I mean, unless you're a high-ranking official like uh, David Petraeus or, I don't know, Jose Rodriguez, who argues that waterboarding isn't torture, and then you can do whatever you want. Um, but uh, then they... Um, yeah, they passed this legislation that was called the Intelligence Identities Protection Act. And that's the law that they got uh, CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou to plead guilty to violating. He's the most recent case, and he went and served uh, 25, 24 months of a 30-month prison sentence in a prison in Pennsylvania. Uh, and they caught him confirming the name of someone who was a undercover CIA officer who, or who was a, at one time, an undercover CIA officer. And so that has usually been applied to people who are employees of the government or are contractors and have signed a, a non-disclosure agreement, have signed for access, they have a security clearance. Um, again, the big issue that I have with this, and so do many people, is we're talking about Julian Assange, uh, a, a journalist or an editor or a publisher, and he doesn't have a security clearance. He never was issued one. Journalists are not issued security clearances. There's no requirement for me or anybody else to have a security clearance in order to publish what we obtain about the U.S. government or the U.S. military or the NSA, etc. We can do this work, and people win Pulitzer Prizes all the time for exposing this material. And all kinds of sensitive information gets obtained. Bob Woodward, of all people, 
he's publishing these books on a regular basis that have highly sensitive materials, and he never gets prosecuted in the way that Julian Assange is being targeted. Um, and so I would say that I I don't I don't I mean if if some lawyer for the government wants to come forward and argue that this law applies to people, that's fine. But up to this point, the we're in a territory that's not really you know, we, we've not entered before. People who work for the government have been prosecuted. People who do not work for the government have typically been left alone by the U.S. government. And so uh, I, I guess I could say that I have some idea as to why those people are not ones who have had to deal with the hammer being brought down on them. and And that's because they tend to not object to U.S. foreign policy to the degree that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks had had done. Um, they tend to not represent themselves as uh, people who are going to, um, you know, not really care whether the U.S. government succeeds or not in what they're trying to achieve in their objectives around the world. Uh, but still, um, those people who have published names in their books that they maybe shouldn't have, who put sensitive information in their books that they maybe shouldn't have, they've never been prosecuted. So, you know, Julian Assange is this crossing of the Rubicon. Right. You know, the speaking of the CIA, um, Chris Hedges had a couple of co uh, comments that maybe you could address. Uh, one is that, you know, in this court case, you're having the... Um, people promising that the judiciary will, I mean, the executive will follow through with these things. But in our, in our government, the judiciary and the executive are separate. They, you know, so any assurances that you make can be just go away. But the more important thing that Chris Hedges said is that it's the CIA that's in the driver with this. It's not the judiciary and it's not the executive. It's the CIA. And ever since Vault 7, and they released these secrets that embarrass the hell out of the CIA, that they're they're on a rampage. They're just wanting to be vindictive, that that's the way they play. Pompeo wanted to kill them. They wanted to have an assassination attempt. Right. They're, they're a separate part of our government. What, what are your thoughts about Chris Hedges' um, kind of pessimism regarding... Uh, those two factors that uh, the judiciary and the executive don't really um, have are separate. So you no promises can be kept and th it's not their issue anyway. It's the CIA's issue. I, I don't know if it's, I mean, it, it could be called pessimism, but to me, that's just a very realistic way of thinking about how things are organized in the U S government. And it's why when you talk to people like me or Stella Assange or the others who are campaigners, our, our main ask is that Joe Biden and the Justice Department drop the charges against Julian Assange immediately. We're not waiting here to try and figure out how the legal system in the UK can spare Julian Assange or, or how the US court system is going to save Julian Assange when he you know, finally arrives and his lawyers get to challenge these charges head on. Uh, because we don't have any faith that those systems are going to stop Julian Assange from being convicted, uh, or that you know this UK system is going to stand up to the United States government and and say no, you can't have Julian Assange. We're going to protect his rights because they they do not want to do that. So, in particular, we saw this in the ruling. I haven't mentioned this yet, but it connects to what you're saying about the CIA. So I definitely should make sure that I bring into our conversation how the high court issued this astonishing uh, excuse, astonishing justification for not admitting evidence or not reviewing fresh evidence related to the, the CIA's reported plans to kidnap or kill Julian Assange. This is what they wrote. I just I just want to read this. On the face of the allegations, on the evidence before the judge and the fresh evidence, the contemplation of extreme measures against the applicant, and the applicant is Julian Assange, 
whether poisoning, for example, or rendition, were a response to the fear that the applicant might flee to Russia. And the short answer to this is that the rationale for such conduct is removed if the applicant is extradited. Extradition would result in the applicant, again, that's Julian Assange, being lawfully in the custody of the United States authorities. And the reasons, if they could be called that, for rendition or kidnap or assassination, then fall away. Uh, I, I found that to be one of the most shocking things I've ever read. I've been covering this for five years. And if I put together a top 10 list of the most astonishing things I've read in relation to this extradition chapter of Julian Assange's life, it would definitely be up there in my top three, simply because they're telling us that extradition is a way of like saving Julian Assange's life. That like basically we don't have to be concerned that he's being extradited because now that means the CIA won't assassinate him or poison him or he can't be renditioned and brought to a U.S. courtroom suddenly. And, you know, he's not going to be tortured in a black site by CIA right. operatives. So then even though those were serious allegations, which they, by the way, they don't say that this didn't happen. They just pretend like it doesn't matter now because a lawful process or a legal process has now been engaged. And so, hey, take it away, U.S. government. We trust you that the CIA won't be trying to murder a journalist at this point. And, you know, what they also do is they're not factually representing what happened. This idea that they think, you know, he was going to flee to Russia, that that comes from the reporting on the CIA. But by the way, the reason why the CIA thought that is because their outfit that they were working with, which they outsourced all this work to, UC Global, which was run by this guy, David Morales, uh, where Spain, he's a, he's a, he was from Spain and uh, he's being prosecuted in Spain right now. Uh, but he had uh, got, he got this contract and, and in a roundabout way, we believe it kind of came through Sheldon Adelson when he went oh to God. Las Vegas Sands and that David Morales was working for American intelligence, funneling video and audio recordings back to them, these feeds that were constantly running uh, of Julian Assange while he was living in the Ecuador embassy. Um, and so uh, what they did was they would put together these exaggerated reports on people who were visiting Julian Assange, and they made up these stories about people because there was pressure on them to connect what they were observing back to Russia. You know, we had Russiagate going on in the United States. It was Russia, 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 Trump administration, Russia, Russia. So they thought a good way to nail Julian Assange would be if they could connect him to Russia, verify some of these allegations that were being promoted through the Robert Mueller investigation and then in other different parts of, uh, of the government. So they obtained these uh, reports and uh, those reports ended up being covered by CNN um, and misreported as like Julian Assange is trying to run an election meddling outpost at the Ecuador embassy. He did nothing of the sort. And there's no proof in that article. I tore it apart just like I tore apart that interview you mentioned earlier with uh, Michael Smirconis talking to Pink Floyd's Roger Waters. But also that this um, this idea that he was going to flee to Russia um, was faked. There was this rogue official working for the, or sorry, it wasn't it wasn't that it was faked. It was sprung on Julian Assange. This has been spoken about by his legal team. And what happened is Ecuador was turning against Julian Assange, and and so this rogue official basically brought Julian Assange a diplomatic passport and tried to assign him to the Ecuadorian embassy in Moscow. And Julian Assange and his people saw it as a kind of, they said, a fait accompli, but they had no choice. And uh, so he said, no, he said, I'm not going to go there. Do you see what's happening in the United States? Do you think I'm that ridiculous that I want to make my life even harder? Because it's that's what will happen because the U.S. has put me in the crosshairs and it'll get even worse if I want to try and flee to Russia. And he said, no, like these are the countries I want, like Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, 
Serbia, some of these other places that might be willing to to challenge the U.S. government. But I'm definitely not going to go to Russia. Um, And he had to say no to getting this diplomatic passport, which was a way out of the Ecuador embassy. But he absolutely did not want to be seen as working on behalf of Russia. You know, what's so strange about this is that one of the things Julian Assange said is that I can't be extradited for political reasons. And he puts forth this example that the head of the CIA had legitimate plans, Not no one's ever said they're not correct, that they were going to drop a helicopter on top of the Ecuador, have a SEAL team come in, take me away and get rid of me, you know, and then drop me out of the helicopter or whatever. And the argument of the court was, well, you know, and then you, you laid out the argument, this absurd logic that, well, it didn't really happen, so it's not a big deal. No, yeah, yes, it did too happen. You know, the CIA is a rogue out of control organization, and he does have some legitimate concerns about that. I don't know. That's my read on it. So... Greg, any final thoughts? Isn't this fun? Isn't this fun yeah, to get yeah, to, to I, sit I, down and just have a cup of coffee yeah. with someone that knows more about this crap than anybody? And I, I, you I, know, I, I, this is cool. I might, Pat, I'd like to ask. I'd like to ask Kevin about a case. I see he was uh, quoted in uh, Fair, uh, the newsletter uh, extra for Fair, around this uh, Tim Burke case, and it looks to me maybe perhaps like a little bit of a. Mini Assange case from Florida. Your thoughts on that? Do you have some uh, uh, some comments about? It? I think it's an important case. It is important because in this example, the U.S. Justice Department is again saying that it can choose who they will or will not classify or treat as a journalist. Uh, they, in fact, in order to defend their actions, have said that at some point. Timothy Burke ceased to be a journalist because he was no longer publishing under a byline on the internet at whatever. So the fact that he's this video person who collects all these different materials from uh, video feeds that he finds online, or he crawl- he scours the internet, by the way, that's what appears in the indictment against him. He's charged with crimes and he's, uh, been accused of scouring the internet, which is like, that's that's something that everybody does that's a journalist. Like What's searching AI the is. internet for, searching the internet for information so that you can find stories and write about uh, anything that's important for your blog or whatever you're doing. That So Timothy Burke did that. But in particular, what, what you're raising is, um, it takes us a bit down a rabbit hole, but I'll just very quickly summarize that Uh, He found that there was, uh, he he had some kind of access to a feed. He says he didn't hack. They accused him of hacking, but he didn't hack into it. He was given access to a feed, and that allowed him to view an unencrypted video of an interview that Tucker Carlson did with uh, the rapper and hip-hop artist Kanye West, who was... uh, in, you know, he was interviewed by Tucker Carlson, and Tucker then aired a version of the interview. Then this, these bits that were cut out, it became clear what Fox News had cut from the interview. They were trying to help Kanye not look like an anti-Semite and somebody who has completely lost his mind and is clearly suffering from mental illness and has all kinds. And it was weird, some of the stuff they took out of it. Uh, so so Tucker was clearly trying to make him uh, not look embarrassing for Fox News to be interviewing him on air. And that became a big story and it was published and it was shared widely. And Fox News claimed that uh, they were hacked. I think they went to the Justice Department and complained. And then the Justice Department turned around and I, I think on behalf of Fox News or News Corp, uh, or uh, Murdoch News Agency, they're basically uh, went after this man, Timothy Burke, and he had his home newsroom raided by FBI agents. All these computers and laptops and other equipment that he has in his home were seized and taken from him. He didn't know for almost a year whether he was going to be charged. He argued that this was a violation of his rights. They said, well, you're not a journalist. 
And um, also, we believe that you violated the law, but they wouldn't say what law he violated. And then finally, um, about a, a couple months ago, they did charge him with crimes. Um, and uh, he's uh, the, the the economic crimes division has taken on this prosecution, which means that if he's convicted, they can confiscate all these computers and equipment that they took. And so any unpublished notes or anything from sources or stuff that he might have collected, databases of video or anything he has for his journalistic work, that can be taken by the Justice Department if they prevail in this case against him. So it's it's I think it's frightening because it shows you how easily the Justice Department can use this authority to come up with ways of stating that they don't believe that you are a journalist and then they just move forward with putting you on trial. So they've done that to Julian Assange. They say, ah, he's not a journalist. So we have full latitude to go after extraditing him. Now they're saying with this journalist in Florida, he's not one. Uh, and so we can go forward and put him on trial. Amazing. Well, and that was with Kanye, with the Kanye West stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess to the Diddy, did Diddy do it or did Diddy didn't do it or did Diddy do kitties <laughs> or did he, you know, I mean, we, we're going to have a whole lot of fun with that, aren't we? All right, here we go. This about time. I'm, I'm going to put you all, all of us on the, on the, uh, on the record here. You got three choices. A, you've got a plea bargain. B, you're going to kick it down the road till after the election, figure out some way to delay it, just keep them in that little hell hold cell. Or C, there's going to be some sort of extradi extraditing move. That's going to be coming out in a week or so. So you've got plea bargain, kick down the road, or extradite. What do you say? Greg, what do you say? Well, what I said in the beginning, I think they want to drag it out. I think this is a message they're trying to send to That's... everybody, uh, including Tim Burke and anybody else that follows these cases, to so... don't go where you're not wanted to go. So that's a so B, kick down the road. Out. Yeah. How about you, Kevin? I think that given the fact that Donald Trump messed this all up when he bowed to GOP pressure and decided not to pardon Assange. They don't really have to worry about him raising Julian Assange on the campaign trail in 2024. Biden's obviously not going to raise it, so they don't have to worry about that either. So I'll go ahead for your show and say, I'll make the case that they would extradite him. I'll, I'll say, oh. I'd say, I'll, I'll I'll say that there are, I'd I'd say that they would be okay with extraditing him. Why? Because what I've learned about the Biden White House and the larger administration, especially through ghouls like Matthew Miller that represent the State Department in apologizing for genocidal violence by Israel in Gaza, is that they when they stake out a position. They just keep hitting it over and over and over again with the same boilerplate nonsense talking points. And anybody who questions them, they do not care if you are opposed to them or not. They just keep saying the same thing over and over again and expecting that people, I guess, are going to at some point leave them alone. I don't know what they're wanting these reporters to do that I watch in State Department briefings. But it's kind of the same way with Justice Department people. In my opinion, this is what they've decided they're going to die on. This is the hill they're going to die on, so to speak. And so why not just bring Julian Assange to the country right now? I don't know that they would put him on trial. They're not going to put him on trial. But put him in a detention center. He gets hidden away, and then they can dust him off and, and bring him out in 2025 or 2026 for a trial. But it certainly won't be anything that Joe Biden has to worry about anymore. And when he's in the United States, there's no more discussion about whether he should be extradited or not. That's a done thing. And uh, it's not like he can be, uh, it's not like Australia can get him back 
after the United States has him in go U.S. government custody. So yeah, just keep him in a detention cell uh, that will be as small or and possibly worse than what he's in in Belmarsh and hide him from the public. He won't be able to speak to us. We won't know what he's going through. And then uh, at some point next year, he could be uh, put on trial if they're ready for it, or maybe not. Uh, I will say, the last thing I'll say is just to understand this national security division, um, I, you know, I, I, they have, se they have had several cases that they, uh, you know, this is a giant case. It took two to three years to finally put Chelsea Manning on trial. It can take two to three years to put Julian Assange on trial, given everything that's involved. So they will just make him wait longer. So I suppose Greg and I can both be right. Yeah. Because, so you're kind of because, well, I, yeah. The, the problem is you're both wrong. It's yeah. going to be a. It's going to be a plea bargain, and I'll tell you why. Because you know Biden has screwed the pooch with this Gaza thing. It's just creating all kinds of problems. He can't do fundraisers with uh, you know all these previous president war criminals. And uh, without people shouting them down. So I think they're going to figure out a way just to get done with this. And, the, and they're just going to figure out a way to time served, be done with it. He's going to be in Australia with his kids in, um, in six months. So anyway, we'll have to, if, if I'm right, we'll come back and do another show. <laughs> if I'm wrong, then the, the hell. Forget it. about so, it. Yeah. So yeah, that's so, story. yeah, I do. I do have one one quote to leave, to to uh, close on. That's was Donald Trump when regarding WikiLeaks when he was running. I think it was disgraceful. I think there should be a death penalty or something. So that's our that's our our future president's um, um, thoughts about this. Maybe so. Kevin, been fun. Been really fun. I'm really I I'm 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 enjoying following you. And uh, this is I I'm looking with great anticipation to what's going to happen. And is it uh, in 10 days or so that they're going to have the final decision? Hey, is it no, no. Well, so the, the timeline of events very quickly is middle of April. So let's say April 14th, April 15th tax day. Uh, they will have to submit their assurances to the court, whatever those promises I spoke about. Will okay. Be. And then there will be a hearing on May 20th about those assurances. Okay. That, that's okay. what we know. That's what we right. know will happen next. And I need to link to uh, House Resolution 934, right? Should I make a, tell, tell me about that. I'll put a link in yeah, our description. Yeah, yeah. So this is the call to action from Stella Assange, Gabriel Shipton, who is Julian Assange's brother in the Assange Defense Committee, that there is a resolution right now, uh, just you know, whether you believe they're going to care or not, write your congressman or call them up and say that they need to sign on to this. It says if you even want people to think you care about freedom of the press, then you must demand that the Justice Department drop the charges against Julian Assange. It's a very simple and easy way to keep people engaged in the case. So let's do it. Good. And it's a weird uh, a list of people that are supporting that so far. <laughs> You know, Democrats and sponsors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Green is well, one. I mean, there's so few people that care about freedom of speech anymore. So yeah. It's unreal. a wonderful unreal. thing that a few do. Kevin, thanks. You're great. We'll, we'll keep following you. Thank you for Thank spending you. some lot, time Kevin. with us. Thanks a lot. Enlightening. Mm -hmm.